All right, so we're still doing descriptive stats. So this whole first test is descriptives. Um, and now we're working on more graphs. So we had histograms and frequency polygons last week. This week we're going to do bar charts, scatter plots, and one more thing that I've already forgotten. Um, <coughs> and so all this is chapter three, and then chapter four is your descriptives you're more familiar with, like means and standard deviations. Um, <coughs> And so I love this chapter because it's all about lying with graphs and how we shouldn't lie with graphs. So I'll teach you how to lie and how not to lie with graphs. Um, the good thing about visual displays of data is that it allows you to present information at a glance. So I can really sort of succinctly present a picture of what happened in my study quickly. Right? So it can reveal like what's going on with the data. Uh, so to give me an example, we had uh, a study, so if you took intro to science last semester, you might have been part of a study where we gave people two different languages. So you learned uh, a little bit of Italian and a little bit of Swedish, and then we looked at the types of questions that people had. So we had basic multiple choice type questions. We had translation questions, but were that they were drag and drop. Uh, and so those still had like a component of I could see all the options. So they were matching type questions. And then we had straight translation questions, where you just had to type out what it was. And the argument was that some languages are easier to learn than others because they match your current language, which would have been English, as a first language. And so what we expected to find was that one language would be easier than the other. So this is percent correct. And so, let's see, how did it work? So basically, everybody was good on the multiple choice because it's pretty easy. It's like, what is an apple? Okay. And then we, it gets worse as we go because the translation is harder. Right? They give you a bunch of symbols, they tell you, what does this mean? But what we really found was that one language was, was much easier than the other until you got the translation. So which one do you think it was? Italian would be easier or Swedish would be easier? Italian? Swedish. I would have thought Italian too. I didn't believe the student when she told me this. Is that how you spell Swedish? Well, close. Yeah. I am bad at spelling. Um, Swedish is actually the same base language that we have. It's more, it's more similar, even with all the funky symbols. Um, Italian is uh, the Romance set of languages. And while people think Romance languages are easier, I guess because we're more familiar with them, Swedish is actually more similar. It was a beautiful, beautiful graph. This isn't maybe the best drawing of the graph. But it was nice because it started out very different and it came together. And I really thought translation is going to be hard for everybody. Um, it's, it doesn't matter what language we're speaking, and that's what we found. So kind of a complicated study, um, which all of the results in one graph. So we can talk about how multiple choice is different, the dragon is different, but translation wasn't. Um, and so I have this website link for you guys here. Let's see if I can copy it. Oh, I didn't need Chrome, but whatever. So what this guy has put together is a uh, gallery of really bad, good and bad graphs. Um, <clears throat> and so there's tons of this stuff. So laurels are good graphs, darts are bad graphs. Um, so he's got the one that's in the book, right? <clears throat> uh, and they're terrible copies. So just different ways of presenting information where people are trying to make it cute, and it ends up just being a terrible graph, because you don't understand what's going on. Evil pies, let's look at that one. Oh, they're terrible pie charts. Like, especially this one. What is that even? Right. So there's tons of websites devoted to this, but I like his website because it explains to you what's wrong with it on the, on the other side. And then they have good graphs, um, good pictures of graphs, like this is a, a fairly common graph that you might see in psych, it's, a, it's called a box plot. We're not going to do one of those, but you might see it. Um, we are going to do one of these types of graphs today, not quite that crazy, but um, a scatter plot with a line on it. Okay. So uh, you can kind of play with it to look at good and bad graphs. But we're going to get into 
uh, how, what the different rules are for graphs and what people do wrong. So uh, this is from the Ithaca Times, clearly, but it's been labeled as one of the most misleading graphs ever because of the way they did it. So it's probably a little easier to read on your screen. Um, but you'll see that this line starts at 1965. This one starts at 1989. A lot happened between those 20 years. Right? Um, and then the blue line is tuition. So obviously tuition is going to increase over time. That's just a natural thing with inflation, with budgets being cut. It's a problem we have in our current state, at least we're not in Wisconsin, they're having some real problems. Right. So that's a uh, cost of tuition increasing over time. Um, but where does that start? Right. At what standpoint? So I have no idea what the scale actually is. So is this per credit hour? Is this total tuition that student might pay in debt? What is this? Um, and then this graph is university ranking. Ranking a low number is a good thing. Right? You want to be ranked first. Um, so the way they're drawing the graph is it looks like as tuition increases, the universe is getting crappier. Right? In reality, what's happening is Cornell's getting much better. Like they're getting ranked higher and higher in their different colleges. So this graph is awful. Never mind that we shouldn't put mix DBs. Right, so this is, a, this is a money base, so it's a ratio scale, and this is an ordinal scale. You shouldn't put those two together like that. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's a horrible graph. I'm sure it did a good job at presenting what they wanted to say, which was why is it so expensive and that's causing all these problems. But really what they're saying is, well, yeah, it's gone up a little bit in tuition costs over 40 some odd years. And we've gotten even better as a university. Um, were they even controlling for inflation? Oh, I'm sure no. Because like that would basically, yeah. I would probably level it out. Yeah. For, um, right. So, uh, I just summarized that. So when you're looking at it later, you can remember what we talked about. Times don't start at the same place. They end at the same place, but they certainly don't start at the same place. The scales aren't the same at all. So one is a money, so ratio scale, one's an ordinal scale. And so why would we rank graphs, do rankings down is better. So you almost never want to make it where something going down actually is a better thing, graphing it that way, because it's really confusing to people. Because if you see going down, you think it's getting worse or getting lower. Uh, so anytime people do ranks, they always reverse it. So up is better. Is that like a, like the same as a reverse variable? Then? Right, yeah. right. You almost never want. It depends. Like some scales, like higher scores are bad. So like the PCLC, which is a PTSD score, high scores are bad. But that's I would expect that. If you tell me I have a scale on depression and I have a high score, it's probably not good. But with rankings, first is better. So you would probably want to reverse it. Yes. <clears throat> so I kind of. I'm going to give you the best examples I have for these. These are probably the harder questions when we get to the quiz, is which one is which. So the false face validity lie um, is where they, ha they have a graph and the, the it's, it's basically a, a validity issue. Okay. So the method seems to represent what you're measuring, but it doesn't quite do that. Okay. So face validity is it measures what it says it measures. Okay. We talked about... Uh, how you shouldn't use um, shoe size to measure intelligence. Um, so the scale looks like it should be measuring what it is, but maybe not so much. Uh, so using yelling as a measure of aggression, I'm a loud person, my TA is a loud person. When we're in the same room together, it probably sounds like we're about to kill each other because we're both just loud people and it just like amplifies. Um, <clears throat> so it's a lots of this that goes on, so many hand motions. Um, so yelling, not so much aggression. If you're at a sporting event, yelling has nothing to do with aggression. Well, okay, less to do with aggression. It depends on what's going on. If you were me yesterday, it was like, yes, take it, pretty take it. So yelling, is it really a measure of aggression? 
So false face validity lie has to do with the scale that's being used to represent on the data. So uh, it's not really a chart problem, it's, right? But it's a problem like when you see it on a chart, it'll look like it's correct, but it's not. It's a design problem. Though. Yes, but then when it's graphed, it's made worse. This is one of my favorites. There's two of these that are very similar. Okay, make sure I don't get them confused. Okay. So this one's more of a design issue as well. So the biased scale lie, um, and it's the way the scale is written that skews the results is like a leading questions issue. Um, so I love Goodreads, I try to read when I'm not grading papers, right? Uh, and their scale, if you've never seen Goodreads before, maybe they've changed it. I hope so, it's terrible. So it's a website that allows you to find books that you should like, um, keep track of your books, that sort of thing. And the scales that they have, let's give a help, to rate the book are one through five. Okay. And it's did not like, it was okay, liked it, Really liked it, and it was amazing. Okay. So they haven't changed it since I wrote these slides. <clears throat> That's kind of leading. Essentially, everything from the, like normally people think of three as sort of a neutral point, right? but even two is like, okay, fine, you really know, it was all right. So if you really hated a book, your only option is did not like. And then if you kind of liked a book, you have like four different options. So it's really leading if the scores are sort of positively biased. So this is a scale issue, the way it's worded. And you see this in political surveys all the time. Um, that was with the, with the last election. I also really love Nate Silver's work. He runs 538. It's, their blog is really great. He does all the political predictions and he does lots of sports predictions. Um, and so that's a lot of the stuff that he talked about on his blog was like, well, these political predictions are terrible because the people doing them clearly have a bias towards what they want to find um, and they're wrong. So. <coughs> So that's a, also still a design issue. The sneaky sample lie is when participants are self-selected or um, they join the study themselves or they're pre-selected because they have a certain type of demographic. And so also a problem with politics. But I love Rate My Professor. It totally cracks me up. <coughs> I have to show you my friend's rate my professor because I can't tell if he like told students to go and do this or if he has filled out a bunch of them on himself, but they're hilarious. Yeah, 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 go away. So can I do this like this? Yeah. All right, so my friend Scott is a professor at Ole Miss <coughs> and he teaches intro to psych couple other classes. He's sort of notorious for how ridiculous he is. Okay, he's the clinical director there. Um, and so he has students write these ridiculous reviews. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and there's one about him being a ninja. They're hilarious. Um, he posted the other day, like, you need to go read these. So I can't tell if he, like, um, Brought them himself, <laughs> or um, had students write ridiculous things for extra credit, but there are some really funny ones. Um, mine are mostly like, don't miss class, <laughs> so mine are not that fun. But <clears throat> that's clearly a like self-selection problem, right? So I would say there are probably just as many people who hate his class, because he tells us about his end of year reviews as well, um, but it looks you know, these scores look like he's really great. Maybe it's not so easy, um, but that's a self-selection problem. If you look at the people in our department, uh, in the psych department, you'll see that what tends to happen is students either really love a class and they'll go and they'll rate it, or they really hate the class. And so we'll have faculty who have just these horrible reviews because they just hated the class. Right? Um, <clears throat> and so that's a self-selection sneaky sample. Politics do this all the time. Magazines. Anytime you see a, a sample in a magazine, you should be suspicious. Right. Yelp. Hmm? Yelp. Oh, yeah. 
generally you have to really like that's the same issue. You really, really love it or really hate it. Yeah. Um, <coughs> also, like the like polls on like who's leading presidential races, and that because like a lot of times the candidates that are more of an asshole are going to be the ones who the people that like them are going to be like, I need to tell you about so and so. Right. They, like a run to a poll story. Well, Trump is leading according to every different news source that you read, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but the yes, margin varies a lot. depends mm -hmm. on who's doing the polling. So that was one of the reasons why they thought, like for a long time they were talking about how close the race was going to be for the last presidential election and then it ended up not being, was because all the Republican polls were only pulling from areas that were traditionally oh, uh, Republican. Uh, uh, um, uh, and so that's one reason I really love the f Nate Silver's work, the 538s, because he shows you where he's polling from, uh, and he's very accurate. So I think he only missed one of the states or one of the polling areas or something, and it was like, we missed it by this much kind of thing. Oh, wow. So having the right type of sample is really important. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, you know, and then almost all of psychology is the what the, the study of college freshmen. So, you know, we have that problem too. So, I'm not saying it's just politics. <coughs> all right. So the interpolation lie. Draw this one. This is like more of a graph issue. Um, so interpolation is when you have two data points. Um, some sort of low something, some sort of high something. Oh, you know what we could do? Uh, arousal. <coughs> this is a famous graph. <coughs> so arousal and performance, I think this is in every intro book. <coughs> um, so thinking about arousal as in like alertness, uh, focus. Uh, and there's some labs that do a whole bunch on this, uh, especially choking under pressure. This is the Biolex lab out of Chicago. It does tons of cool work on why athletes, great athletes choke, why you get this sort of nervous feeling. So really low levels of arousal, you're basically asleep. So you get low levels of performance, and at really high levels of arousal, you're really anxious, so you get low levels of performance. Okay. Um, so the interpolation lies to assume that arousal and performance are unrelated. That's basically the same across the entire span. In reality, if you measure people at medium levels of arousal, you actually get this sort of uh, U-shaped curve. Okay. So interpolation is assuming that the path is linear between points without knowing what the middle points are. Okay. So it assumes that the values between the two data points are on the same pattern. Yeah. Can't you also do this like in R and like by choosing an inappropriate thin width, you can make like a bimodal curve, like unimodal, which looks a lot better. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, at that point, you're squishing it. Yeah. Or, but like if you're making a frequency call it polygon, though. Interpolation. Because like if you like if you make the points that the frequency polygon is connected with far enough apart, you can kind of. Describe. Right, I would actually call that one of these next slides, okay. the inaccurate values lie. But because of you're distorting the, the scale, this is like just assuming that we know that it's this oh, okay. linear path. Filling in too much data. <clears throat> Extrapolation is we're going to assume people understand things that are coming from outside the study. So this comes back to your point about inflation. Um, so extrapolation is not really a problem with the graph so much as it is the problem with the people reading the graph. So you are assuming they understand something about this type of graph that, that, uh, that let me back up, down is good. Right. So you assume that they know that ranking a lower score is better. Uh, in reality, most people look at down and they think bad. Okay. So. Interpolation is like between two points. Extrapolation has to do with outside the study. So you're assuming that people understand these other forces that are part of this graph. <coughs> All 
My absolute favorite one is the inaccurate values lie because everybody does this at least once. I have several graphs published that I would say are probably, this is a problem. Um, but I'm gonna pick on Michelle Bachman because it's easy. Okay. It's a lot of politics talk because politics is really where a lot of lying with graph occur, graphs occur. But researchers in other fields do it too because it is a pretty graph. Okay. So after one of uh, Obama's um, early presidential states of the union sorts of thing, they were talking about budget. So she had this graph on like a poster board. I was like, is this like a science fair? <laughs> what is she doing? Um, and she had like the Bush administration and then she had Obama and this was debt and it was gesticulating wildly about the like, giant increases in debts and all the problems with the debt we were all going to burn, right? But if you looked at the numbers on the side of the graph, it went from 6.1 trillion to 6.3 trillion or something very small like that. Okay. And so that's when you pull the scale apart to create a better picture. This is a much better story that they were trying to sell because the real graph, had we put zero on the bottom, would have been very boring. You wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. Right? <clears throat> and this is the easiest thing to do in research papers as well, is to not make the bottom of the graph um, the end of the scale. Uh, because R doesn't necessarily know that a numeric scale is one to five. So you sometimes have to cut off zero because people can't score zero. So it's easy to stretch out a graph. Uh, so back to your comment on bin widths, that's a problem with the mm -hmm. x-axis. Okay. So, inaccurate values is anytime you're like stretching the scales or squishing them to make uh, your story better. Okay, that's why bin width is kind of tricky. So you have to find the right balance between too many and too little. And then the outright lie, that's an easy one, is when they make up the data. So we just flat make up the data. And there's a bunch of, not a bunch, there are, there are several interesting stories um, about cheating. So there's a, a bunch of Freakonomics on the teacher cheating scandal in Chicago that are really interesting. Uh, sort of, <clears throat> ah, lost all train of thought right there. This is a famous case in psychology about a social science researcher, but his name just jumped right out of my head. <clears throat> and then the probably the most famous one with the most significant effects was the, uh, the story of uh, Wakefield, who made up all the data on autism and vaccines. It's like, I had a story, I had a, this had a point, it's going somewhere, right? <clears throat> so, while making up data in science, like especially in psychology, we don't, I mean, I don't want to say we don't have an impact, but generally the impact is not, at least in what I do, so large that that's just going to mess up some other people who are researching in my area. But you can have really large impacts with made up data. Um, and so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I can send you some links. The big social science guy who had been making up scales. That essentially like screwed the careers of everyone he had ever worked with as well. So while on the one hand you're like, okay, well that's just research into like sociology, yeah, whatever, but it also impacted people's lives. <coughs> All right. So I don't have examples of all of them, but just some from the book. So inaccurate values lie. Right, so the years over, it's like years over here, and um, miles per gallon per car over here. And so the graph is just nuts, up, right? <laughs> so it's trying to make it look like we're getting much better gas mileage than we're really not. Okay. <clears throat> so it's like, here's 27, and here's 27 and a half. Um, another example, so if I graphed traffic deaths for one year, so first of all, this does not start at zero, so there's your biased scale, or I'm sorry, your 
inaccurate values to stretch the scale. But I also haven't shown you the other data points around it, so it's an interpolation issue, where you're just assuming that it's going to keep going down. But if you look at traffic deaths, that's actually a, a peak. So it actually had been increasing by quite a lot to that point, and then it started to go down. You see this a problem a lot, especially in the city. They're really bad at doing this sort of thing. They'll tell you that, or for a while it was like the newspaper was like, harvest going up, we're all going to die. And the police chief was like, no, it's not, it's fine. And then the reality was somewhere in the middle. Right? Um, so you have to be really careful when you're bringing presented data that's just a small slice of like a longer to continue. Because okay? then you end up with uh, scaling issues right, and interpolation at the same time. Okay, so graphs can be more than one type of problem. Okay, now let's talk about making graphs. Woo. So, scatter plot, I don't know what a scatter plot is. Yeah. The thing about scatter plots, you want to make sure. Okay, we've already talked about histograms and frequency polygons. They have one continuous variable. When you're writing that aesthetic function thing, there's one column in here. So they have one continuous variable, and then y is the frequency. Now, if we do scatter plots, we have to have two continuous variables. So we're going to have two columns in the aesthetic. So we can do more than one there. There's lots of things you can do in the aesthetic function, but we're going to kind of go simple. Okay. So scatter plots have a relationship between two scale variables, so they've got to be ratio or interval. Remember, scale is sort of the word for continuous. Um, you have to deal with the range frame issue, uh, which is part of the inaccurate values lie. So making sure that the uh, scale of the graph covers the scale of the data. Um, R will do that for you mostly automatically. Uh, and then the cool thing about scatter plots is it allows us to look at every person's data. When we get the bar graphs, we sort of summarize the data. But scatter plots allow us to see each individual person. So each dot is a person or data point, um, and that allows us to make some like guesses at what's going on with the data. So it might be linear, the dots form a straight line, or curvilinear, where they've got a bend to them. Lots of things have a linear relationship, as one goes up, the other goes up, as one goes up, the other goes down. Um, so as I have more coffee, I get more like right after about three, just like I'm not useful too much. Right? But performance and anxiety, that thing we graphed a minute ago, is a curved relationship. There's lots of data that follows what, what's called power functions. So this is a power function where it levels off like that. So I would say that learning R is a power function is just like straight uphill for a while. Like, what is all this crap? And then at some point, you only learn like a couple of new things every once in a while. So you sort of level off. Um, so hopefully we'll get you guys to like up here by the end of the semester. <coughs> um, so cheesy scatter plot from the book. The more you study, the better you'll do, hopefully. Right. <coughs> but what we're going to do is build one using air quality. I know we keep using air quality, but it's an easy data set to work with. And I tried not to like load any data today since we were having problems with that before. Um, <clears throat> but let's get studio going. All right, so we're gonna use the air quality data set. Let me make this bigger so you can see it. Yeah, 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 I know. There we go. So, even though it's there in the background, 
I'm gonna run these two lines just so I can see what's going on with it. Um, so all of these are currently listed as numbers or integers, which is uh, something you can do a histogram with. But really, month, when we get to bar charts here in a little bit, month is not really an integer. Right, they've listed it as an integer, but we tend to think of month as more categorical. So we're going to talk about how you can switch things from integers to categories and back. Um, but we're going to start with a scatter plot. Okay, so first thing, be sure you load the ggplot2 library. So it's a library, ggplot2. Oh, right. You're on a school computer, be sure you install it. And whoever was having that install packages problem, I still don't have an answer for you. I googled the hell out of that this weekend. <clears throat> okay, so if you're on your computer, you can just load the library. If you're on a school computer, you've got to install it first. So we're going to build a blank plot. So this is what we did last time with histograms. But now we've got two columns. So it does x comma y. Whichever one you put first is x. Yeah. What do you type into install? You know, the easier thing to do, it's install dot packages. Or over here under packages, click on install. And then you can start typing in here. That's a little easier, because somebody's computer was bugging out and install packages wasn't working. So, <clears throat> so I'm sure you turn on the library, or you will get a ggplot function not found. So you don't have to call it my plot. You can call it whatever you want. Okay. You can call it this is a scatter plot. There's no spaces in the in the name. Try to avoid spaces at like all costs when it comes to variable names or data set names. Don't use spaces. Um, so you can call this whatever, but I'm going to call it my plot. Remember, ggplot is the function that tells it we're making a blank plot. Okay. Data set is the name of the data set, so I've got air quality here. And then aesthetic is what are my x and y columns. Okay. So now I have more than one. If you only put one in there, it's pretty much like you're going to do a histogram. If you have more than one, you can do bar charts uh, and scatter plots. Okay. So we're going to temp an ozone. Generally, you can cut and paste from PowerPoint or Word into R, unless it has quotes, especially if you're on a Mac. Sometimes it doesn't, the quotes don't transfer right. Um, and you'll often get this little like X thing out here when something's wrong with the line. So if that happens, look at where your quotes are. And this doesn't have any quotes, so that makes that easy. It's kind of a word of warning. <laughs> So I created that plot, and then I told it to draw me my plot, my blank plot. <clears throat> so I've got temp on the bottom, and it was on the side. What does it do here? So what it does automatically for you is it gives you the range of the data. So yes, temperature can go all the way to zero or negative, but it, only, it ended here at 60 because that's where the data ends. And it's not a bad way to do things. So this is the range of the data. You could also do the range of the scale. So I could make it show all the zero temperatures. But in a sense, that's almost lying as well, because it's like, well, here are all these zero that you could have had. So 50 to zero. But we didn't have any of that, so I'm just slapping it on here for fun. Right. So generally, the range of the data is also a good way to go. All right. So I'm going to add something. Okay. So I'm going to show you how I make these plots. Um, if you don't like the style, don't do it this way, but it also helps in like figuring out where your code's gone wrong. I'm going to end this line with a plus. I'm going to hit enter. And what you'll see is that it will automatically move me down, and there's a little, it's tabbed over. Okay. And that's because this line goes with the previous one. Okay, so I'm getting my plot plus something else. You can all run it in one big line, but we're about to have stuff that's very long. So um, you'll see in a second why I like it kind of spaced out like this. Okay. <coughs> 
So I've got my plot. What am I add to it here? It's geom underscore point. It is not geom underscore scatter. It's point because we're adding the points to it. Um, and don't do dot plot. It's very tempting if you can't remember and it gives you all the options. No, don't do dot plot. And so plus geom point. So now if I want to add, do the graph, I have to run both lines. So if you hit control enter, or control R, or command, whatever, and do one line at a time, it will wait until you get to the end. So see how I did my plot plus, and then it says G on point here. So R knew that I was still doing something. And having it in this style really helps you see like what the layers are that you're adding. And then once you get to making sort of complicated graphs, you can figure out where you made a mistake. Um, it gave me an error. The error is because there were missing values, and it can't plot missing values, so I don't have to worry about that. <coughs> so if I look at this ozone by temperature, we either have some outliers, crazy things up here, or it is curvilinear. So I'd have to figure out is this. A uh, problem with just a couple of really weird days. So it's linear like this, or is it actually curvilinear? And I just don't have a good representation up here. But man, that is an ugly graph. Yeah, with the lines and the gray background. I do not know why ggplot's default is this ugly ass gray background. So. Well, the dots aren't the problem. To me, it's the background. If you go to this next line, I know it looks crazy. <laughs> but if you copy this whole thing, being careful of the quotes, right? So we're going to copy this entire thing. And you will want to save this. Don't change any of this. Copy it as is. <clears throat> Mine seems to have copied OK. So make sure you don't get any um, weird X's next to it. Okay. This is what it should look like. Okay. So let me show you what that's going to do. Kind of write this code out. So this theme coding here is a way to clean up the graph. And so panel grid major is the major grid lines. So there are thicker grid lines on here. It's hard to tell. And I'm turning them off, element blank. Panel grid minor, turn that crap off. Panel background, turn it off. So that's going to turn off all of that background stuff. And that's going to add axis lines and also uh, deal with the legend if you have a legend. So you want to run that whole shebang. So what that did, it didn't do anything to my plot, clearly, but it saved, um, this down, sorry. it saved this little theme thing. And so that, having that saved as theme, well, then I'm going to apply it in any graph I want. Okay. Now, when you close R and open it up again, it's not going to remember what theme is, so you're going to have to rerun this line several times, but you can just cut and paste it across code. So you'll be able to use that all semester. So I'm going to take my plot and add theme to it. So I've got, here's my basic plot, add the dots, add the theme. So that's where I'm kind of stacking them together. And then run all three lines. Or the, the one line if you have it all squished together. Make this just bigger. That's much better. Yeah, I can actually read this graph. So it deletes the background. It adds the axis it makes a really big difference on bar charts. Let me get to those. Yeah? Questions on that? Anybody get any random errors? Screwy stuff? No? So you'll have to rerun, like add theme here, and then rerun all three. That's what I'll turn Got it. 
If you've ever taken a computer programming class, I talk about that idea a lot. Okay, so that is much nicer. Well, let's talk about changing some labels. That's what we're in today. So let's say if I wanted to make, now the variable names on this are kind of pretty already, temp and ozone, but let's say I wanted to make it like temperature, in degrees, Fahrenheit, ozone, I don't know what that actually is. How do I change X and Y? Okay, so this is an Excel. You can't just click on it and type on it. So um, it fortunately is XLab for X label and YLab for Y label. <coughs> so I'm going to add an X label. Stuff and things. You can make it whatever you want just to see how this works. And then a Y label. But you do have to run all the lines at once. Or you can run one line at a time, but you still have to run all of them. So you can hit Control R or Command Enter until you get to that. Don't just run the last one. That would be really awesome if it was like, oh, and add this, but it's not this one. You see, to change my labels. So you can add more descriptive labels to your graph. All right, we're going to stop there. Um, so that is how we make the basic scatter plot, and we can change that ugly background and the labels. And then what we'll do next time is add a line to it and the new bar charts.